What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. It's the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. That is the whole reason for this show. We are here to answer questions that you may have about the Catholic faith, especially those of you who are not Catholic. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us today in Serbia, please dial 1 and then 205 271 2985. And if you're watching us on TV today, you can participate as well. Here is our email address, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Rich Jesse is our producer. Matt Kabinsky is our phone screener. Charles Beery handling social media for us. If you would like to ask a question via YouTube or Facebook, we are streaming on both those platforms right now, along with our other uh, platforms that we are on all the time. So all you have to do is uh, put your question in the comments box, and then uh, Charles will see that. He'll shoot it to us here in the studio. Hopefully we can answer your question on today's program. Again, the phone number, 833-288-EWTN. I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Very well. How are you, my friend? No, I'm decent. Thank you. We have an objection here from Erica, and this is something I have never run across, and hopefully she's not referring to something heard on this network or this show. Erica says, I heard a Catholic say Jesus is anxiously awaiting his second coming when he will be fully Jesus and will then be fully resurrected. The host of the show didn't disagree. Am I missing something? Again, that's from Erica. Um, yeah, we, I, I don't know that you're missing anything, but this person who said this is missing a lot, a few marbles, <laughs> I would say, right? So this is definitely not the Catholic position. Jesus is not half resurrected. He is fully resurrected. And uh, anxiety is not something that characterizes the state of mind of the risen, glorified king of the universe. So there is a second coming on the way, but it's coming in God's perfect time, and Jesus is not anxious about it. All right. Well, there it is. Erica, thanks again uh, for your question. Uh, here's uh, something that came in from MG uh, watching us on YouTube. MG says, God is a gender. Jesus Christ is a man. The Father is a man, and the Holy Spirit is a man. Can you explain this to me? No, because it's not the Catholic doctrine. Okay. God's not a man. The Holy Spirit is not a man. The second person of the Trinity is not a man except in the assumption of the human nature, which is the person Jesus Christ. But mm -hmm. eternally, the divinity is neither male nor female, has no gender, has no biological sex, because it has no biology. There it is. So, But Jesus, the incarnate Lord, is a man. Of course. MG, thanks so much for your question. Glad that you're watching us on YouTube. Here's another YouTube question, this one from Remington. If the Son is begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Son and the Father, why do Orthodox Christians profess the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone and not the Son? Okay, so it depends on who you ask as to why they do this. So when you, Sacred Scripture has, uh, discusses both the mission of the Spirit from the Father and the mission of the Spirit from the Son. So you find texts where Jesus says this, you know, when I send my Spirit to you and, and so forth. So you'll find both kind of languages in, in sacred scripture. The fathers of the church also will use both will use both uh, formulations. They'll talk about the spirit proceeding from the father. They'll talk about the spirit proceeding from the son. You find both formulations. Um, but uh, in, the, in the Nicene Creed, the initial version of the creed, we don't find the phrase and the son in the initial statement of the creed. It just wasn't what was at issue in the Arian controversies. It's not wasn't in there. Um, and, uh, and that became the way that the faith was professed in, in liturgy. Now, in the Latin West, in the 6th, 7th century, particularly in Spain, the phrase, and the Son, was added to the creed locally in Spain, in certain dioceses, to combat the heresy of adoptionism, which was a kind of form of Arianism. It was a low Christology, and by emphasizing that the Spirit is also the Spirit of Jesus, that underscored the full divinity of Christ. It was a, another way of shoring up 
uh, the Nicene definition. And eventually that formulation made it to Rome and was approved by the Pope and became, uh, particularly after the Carolingian era, uh, more common in the Latin church to confess the spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Um, and it wasn't a, a point of controversy with the Orthodox until the the, the Phocian schism. Now, Phocius was a, a, a usurper of the See of Constantinople, and the Pope opposed him uh, rising to that to that office in the Church, and so he uh, he had reason to take issue with the Pope. And one it one could cynically hold that Phocius was sort of looking around for reasons to reject the Western Church and the authority of the Pope. And he came up with anything, he sort of threw a bunch of stuff at the wall to see what would stick. So among other things, he, he got all upset that the Latin church used unleavened bread in Holy Communion. He, uh, he took a swipe at uh, the Latin church for having shaven priests. Um, believe really? it or not, he, he took offense that the, that the Catholic church opposed the practice of the Sortes Biblicae, which was a form of biblical divination. Um, so lots of things got thrown around that the Latin Church, and then, oh, by the way, the Latin Church also confesses the Filioque and the Creed. And uh, so the, the context of his opposition seems to me to have been largely provoked by a political concern, not one that was overtly theological. But of all the complaints he made against the Latin Church, the one that really stuck, of course, was the question of the filioque. Now, what has happened subsequently in Catholic Orthodox relations is that some Orthodox theologians have really doubled down on that and assert th not, not just, well, you know, you shouldn't throw the filioque in the creed when, when the ecumenical council didn't put it there. And that's, that's the way it's often framed, a question of, hey, who has the right to change the creed? Does the pope do it unilaterally, or do you need an ecumenical council? Uh -huh. Some Orthodox theologians want to argue that there are more substantive questions at issue about the very nature of the Godhead at stake. Uh, 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 Lasky, for example, the Russian Orthodox theologian, uh, takes that position. He's very adamant that he, no, this is really a fundamental issue. Other Orthodox theologians are, are less concerned and think, well, you know, it's it's a point of difference, but it, it really boils down to a question of ecclesiology, who has the right to change the creed. So there's a long political history there. There is, there are some theological differences. We can talk about it another time. Uh, but uh, but ultimately, in, in my view, what, what caused it to rise to a level of such importance was uh, political considerations, and of course, it became sort of a cause celebre after the uh, the after the, um, uh, the the schism of 1054. All right, very good. And uh, Remington, thanks so much for your question via YouTube. By the way, if you'd like to send us an email for a future show, especially if those of you watching on TV today, here's the address: ctc at ewtn.com. We'll get back to you in just a moment with lots more. Call to communion with Dr. David Anders. Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews here on EWTN. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. We're going to begin things here with Dennis, a first-time caller in Danville, Kentucky, listening to us online, EWTN.com. Hey there, Dennis. What's on your mind today, sir? Uh, yes, hello. I'm, I'm, I'm a long-time listener. Um, I have um, an 18-year-old nephew that uh, last year I had him coming to uh, Catholic Church. I'm a, I just converted three years ago, and your show helped me to do that, by the way. But anyway, uh, he was coming with me, but he's gone to college now, and he has made a, friends with a group of uh, Muslims, and they have pulled him into the Islam faith, and he says now he's converted, and we're just kind of taken back by that as a family, and would like some advice on maybe you know, the era of that belief and to see what you have to say. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the question. So that is kind of a shocker, isn't it? Well, um, you know, as Islam has has moved into the Western world and become socially, demographically more a part of Western culture, and there are Muslim communities in the West, in Europe and North America, and this is becoming increasingly common, right? And the traffic goes both ways. Actually, there are people who leave the Islamic faith and become Christians. Uh, but that is going to happen. And, and in my judgment, it's uh, most religious conversions happen. And that's this is true of conversions to Catholicism as well, um, because of the people with whom you associate. Sure. And relationships that you form, birds of a feather flock together sort of thing. And where, where most of your friends are, that's where your religious, uh, your religious identity is often formed and where your alliances are drawn. 
Um, and it seems to me that that's, that that's probably a lot of it. Now, there's, a, there's something else going on on college campuses today, and I'm sure you're aware of it. And there is a deep anti-Western, anti-colonialist bias that pervades uh, uh, the, uh, the political culture of the universities. And in that, in that frame of reference, Islam is often portrayed as a victim of Western powers. And, uh, and so by identifying with Islam, one gets to don the mantle of, you know, kind of the, the cult of the victim that seems to be what is driving everything in political discourse in the Western world today. And, uh, uh, you know, a kind of martyr complex. And, and it's not uncommon, as you also know, for young people to repudiate the traditions of their parents or their, or their birth families and to go off to college and, you know, do something radical in the 1960s. Of course, it was the hippie movement. And oh, yeah. there's always, you know, there's always been something like sure. that in the world sure. for kids. And, uh, and this, this kind of um, anti-Western, anti-colonialist thing uh, with, uh, with a very benign interpretation and view of Islam is, uh, is very much part of that culture. So I'm not, it, it doesn't surprise me that, that some Western kid would get drawn into that and be sort of taken by the romance of it. I mean, from my point of view, I obviously don't believe the Muslim faith. I, I don't think that the Quran is divinely inspired or delivered by God. I don't think that Muhammad was his prophet. <clears throat> and I think, I mean, in my view, the, the record of Islam historically throughout history has is, is not been one to inspire me to want to become a Muslim. And, uh, and the view of Islam as a kind of uh, innocent victim of Western colonial powers, I think, just runs roughshod over the actual history, which is one of very aggressive uh, Muslim imperialistic expansionism. And uh, 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 a book by, oh, my mind has gone blank for a second. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, the Lost Christianities, that's the title of the book. If I can't think go. of the, the author has escaped me. Okay. He's a, he also wrote, I'll come, I'll come back to it in a second. Sure. But, but pick up the book, The Lost Christianities. And it is a wonderful history of the, what used to be the demographic heartland of the Christian faith, which of course was the Middle East, right? North Africa, the Middle East. Um, Asia Minor, and at one time, at one time, the um, uh, uh, the Sea of Baghdad was in fact the most populous Christian diocese in the entire world. Wow! Right? And uh, and Egypt, of course, was a center, uh, intellectual center of Christian learning and theology, and uh, to say nothing of Jerusalem and so forth, and Constantinople, and all you know, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and of course that entire. Expression of the Christian faith was was utterly decimated. Although decimated is the wrong word, because etymologically that means one out of ten. It was more like nine out of ten. Mm. Um, and why? As a result of aggressive Muslim expansionism, and uh, of course uh, Islam, you know, conquered Christian Egypt, Christian North Africa, Christian Middle East, Christian Byzantium, yeah. um, and uh, and pushed all the way to the gates of Vienna. And of course, in the eighth century, attempted to to conquer the Kingdom of France. And um, and uh, and and would have done so gleefully, right? And in our own history of the United States, uh, Thomas Jefferson was uh, an envoy in France. He was a diplomat for the United States before he was president, and uh, he had to deal with the the Barbary pirates, the Barbary states of North Africa that were uh, rampaging and and pillaging and taking uh, Christian crew into slavery and and expropriating their goods. And uh, there's a celebrate exchange between Franklin and the and the ambassador from Tripoli and he said basically why uh, well what gives you the right to waylay all of our ships and capture our cargo and sell our crews into slavery and the response was well you know we have the sword of Allah and God on our side and you're pagan heretics and we're going to keep going until you're all under our boot wow. that, was, that was the position right mm. that was the orthodox position among Muslims and uh, I'm not saying that Every Muslim in the world takes that point of view by any stretch of the imagination, but that is the dominant historical position of the relationship <clears throat> between the two traditions, and uh, it's something that Pope Benedict talked about. He, you know, raised a lot of hackles among among Muslims worldwide, but his famous address at Regensburg uh, was on this question about you know what what do you do about the question of religious violence in the world today, and what is the role of reason in the pursuit of uh, religious goods and and the life of virtue and, and Islam and, and Catholicism really have very different views about what it means for humanity to flourish and the role of reason in public life, the role of religion in public life, the role of violence in public life. And, uh, and so there really are very, very different approaches to, to the religious question. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so for Dennis, though, 
his attitude, uh, and I know what you're going to say because we've been doing this for a long time, lead with love, right? Absolutely. Lead Absolutely. with love and, and, you know, be there to answer those questions that he may have. Sure. Dennis, thank you so much for your call. That opens up a line for you right now at 833 833- 288 EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Call to communion with Dr. David Andrews here on EWTN. Question here from Jay watching us on YouTube today. I was wondering when I watch a mass, why do the priests and readers usually speak in a sing-songy type fashion? Is there a reason for that? I'm not referring to the homily, but rather the readings and the mass parts. Yeah, so uh, especially the gospel, there's a long tradition of chanting or singing the gospel, and essentially it's a way of, of underscoring that this is a text set apart, that this, these, are, these are the words of God. This is sacred for the same reason that we use incense, and uh, it's very common for the, uh, for the priest to sense the book of the gospels before he reads and to sense the people as well. So it's just, it's just one more way of identifying by gesture, by tone, um, uh, by smell uh-huh. that uh, that this is this is important stuff. Wake up and pay attention. All right, uh, Jay. Thanks so much for uh, watching us today on YouTube. It's called a communion. Philip with Jenkins. Talk- Philip Jenkins. That's Ro- the, wrote the book. That's the one I'm. Le- the sorry, it's the lost history of Christianity. Not to be confused with the lost Christianity. The lost history of Christianity by Philip Jenkins. Fantastic. That was the book I had in mind. I knew. I have full faith and confidence Thank in you. you. Thank Knew you. you could come up with it. Call to communion here on EWTN. We have a couple of open lines at the moment, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Here's an email from Samuel. A speaker said the Mass and the crucifixion are the same sacrifice, and that when you attend Mass, you are present at Calvary. Is this correct? I really profoundly appreciate this question. So here is what the Council of Trent taught. The Mass and Calvary are specifically the same and numerically different. Wow. All right, which is to say that each individual Mass is a distinct oblation that is distinct from Calvary. And there is a common view that is erroneous that holds that the function of the Mass is to serve as a kind of, kind of uh, 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 time capsule or, a, or, a, or a, uh, a time vehicle that carries you supernaturally back 2,000 years. And so that the only sacrifice at which you are present is the historical sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. That position is false. That position is the Calvinist position. That's the Protestant position. Um, It was repudiated by the Council of Trent, and it was repudiated again uh, more recently by Pius XII, right? Sometimes called the mystical view of the Mass, the idea that the Mass simply carries you back to Calvary and that there is no distinct oblation offered in the Mass itself. That is an erroneous position. So how does the thing actually work? Here's what the Council of Trent taught. Here's what St. Thomas taught. Here's what the Pope taught. This is the faith of the Catholic Church. The same victim who died on Calvary, Jesus Christ, who died in a bloody manner on the cross, that same victim is present on the altar of sacrifice in the Mass through transubstantiation, but in an unbloody fashion. He's not killed on the altar at Mass. In fact, he's glorified. It's the glorified Jesus, not the bloody dying Jesus who's there. But nevertheless, the same victim that died at Calvary is present in the Mass once in a dying fashion, now in an undying, never to die again, unbloody fashion. The priest that offered the sacrifice at Calvary, namely Jesus, was present at Calvary. The same priest is present at Mass. Through the person of the ministerial priest, through his intention, Christ makes his own intention present, namely to offer his body and blood to the Father in reparation for the sins of the world. The reason that Christ died at Calvary, namely to reconcile God and man, is also present in the sacrifice of the Mass, which is why we talk about them being specifically the same. But they are numerically distinct, so that each individual Mass is its own oblation. It's not simply a time portal back to the past. The priest can say Mass on Monday for, you know, Aunt Edna, and Mass on Tuesday for, you know, my knee surgery, and Mass on Wednesday for peace in the world, and each of those is a distinct oblation with a distinct intention for the Mass. 
Uh, so that's the position of the church. That's the position of the church. Okay. Samuel, thanks so much uh, for your email. Back to the phones now at 833-288-EWTN. Joe is listening in Cleveland on AM 1260, The Rock. Hey there, Joe. What's on your mind today, sir? Hey, hey gentlemen. How are you? Hey. Um, so my question is about, um, you know, when we talk about culpability and how in mortal sin you know, we have to know that something is wrong and give free consent to it anyway for the sin to be mortal, right? Um, I'm thinking about um, people who do things that are bad, and yet in their heart of hearts, they believe that they are doing something good, even God's will, for instance. So, Let's take, you know, kind of an, an extreme example. I hate to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it anyway, like the 9-11 hijackers, all right? They believed, at least I think they do, they believed in the bottom of their heart that they were doing God's will, right? They were they were engaging jihad against the Western world, against the infidels of the Western world or whatever they believed, but I, my understanding is that they really believed that they were doing the will of God in the bottom of their conscience. So, like, what do we say about that sure. and their culpability? Sure. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like, like, are they are they guilty uh, sure. from our perspective? Sure. Sure. Okay. okay, that's my so question. So, let me yeah. use a, a, a similar illustration. There were many young people in the 60s and early 70s that bought Timothy Leary's story that psychedelic drugs would open the third eye and they would attain some kind of cosmic consciousness and become one with the universe and that all the work of uh, of, of the Hindu ascetic tradition could be theirs, you know, for the price of a drop of acid, right? And that was really the tout, right? That the, the psychedelic movement of the 60s was, uh, you know, uh, turn on, t you know, tune in and drop out. And, mm -hmm. and for very little effort, you can have spiritual enlightenment. And I'm sure that quite a few young people believed that. They actually thought that they were doing something that was spiritually beneficial to them by taking all these hard drugs. And uh, and what they did instead was blow their minds, like in a bad sense. They, yeah. they, they destroyed their minds. They destroyed their consciousness. Uh, and many of them ended up, you know, sick and, and, and violated and all kinds of horrible things happened to them. So, so the actions that they took were in fact very harmful to their persons. Regardless of whether or not they believed that would be the case, it did not tend to their flourishing. It, it led to something very different. It led to them doing harm to themselves and other people. All right? And from a Catholic point of view, what makes a moral act good or bad is whether or not it tends to the flourishing, to the happiness, to the well-being of a rational creature namely the, the human person, the, mm -hmm. the rational good of a spiritual, rational creature. If it tends to that end, then it is a moral good. If it tends away from it, then it's a moral evil. Now, uh, a person could start out on a moral path because they've been indoctrinated and perhaps be guilt-free. But at some point in the process, the result of their actions will begin to knock up against the very thick wall of reality. And, and then the possibility of disillusionment sets in. And you realize, you know, I was taught one way, and I'm beginning to realize that that's not going well for me. Like the truth that I always thought I believed is beginning to wreak havoc in my life. Now my reason is engaged, and I have to make a decision as to whether or not to follow the, the rule of right reason or to follow the prejudices of my culture or my indoctrination. Now, I don't want to make myself an example, but I'm going to make myself an example here. Okay. I was raised in a fundamentalist religion, Protestant fundamentalism, that taught me a lot of what I now hold to be manifest nonsense. And it did me harm in life. But it, at some point, I began to realize this is actually doing me harm. And running up against reality caused me to have a wake-up call and explore the Catholic faith as an alternative. Now, let me come back to this question on the other side of the break. Stick with us there, Joe. We'll continue with this. We'll also talk with Nick in Illinois, Thomas in Philadelphia, Eric in Kansas, and lots more on this edition of Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders.
Glad you're with us for this edition of Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews here on EWTN. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Before the break, we were talking with Joe in Cleveland who was wondering about the culpability of a wrongdoer if that wrongdoer believes he's actually doing the right thing. Yeah, so what I began to say before the break is that it's it's possible to be indoctrinated into some a religious or political ideological position that you can believe quite sincerely because the rhetoric was persuasive to you and and you can follow that you know in all good faith but if it's a wrong-headed philosophy eventually you're going to run up against reality and reality you know always wins uh, to to paraphrase John Cougar and and uh, like this happened in my own life when I was raised in a fundamentalist religion that you know taught me a lot of things about human relationships and the way we know God and the nature of human flourishing that I now regard to be just absolutely false. And at some point in my early adulthood, I I came to the realization that my religion was actually making me a bad person. It was making me kind of a narrow-minded bigot and an arrogant jerk and not someone who was, you know, genuinely virtuous and kind and and open to the good in other people. And and, uh, and that troubled me a lot. And at the same time, I, I began to learn about the Catholic view of the moral life and the virtues and and so forth, and I began to say, hey, you know, if I became Catholic, it would actually solve the problems that fundamentalism has created for me. And so on the occasion of reality sort of beating me in the head, it, it was a, a wake-up call in my conscience and helped me see, yeah, Catholicism is a, is a really viable way out of this dilemma. So I think if someone is indoctrinated uh, and, and their doctrine leads them into harmful actions, actions that really tend away from human flourishing towards human suffering and misery, then uh, if, if they have any kind of rational capacity at all, that, that's going to become apparent to them. And it's in that moment, I think, that, that moral responsibility can, can, can take hold. And so St. Paul talks about this in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 1. He, he talks about people who... who um, who are experiencing in their own bodies the consequence of their irreligious doctrine and the suffering that they bring upon themselves is an occasion for them to recognize the reality of the God of reason, the God of creation, and the God of love. And in that moment, he finds their moral responsibility. So I do think someone who's raised in another religious tradition and is very sincere in their belief but does something that's fundamentally harmful can, in fact, be brought into confrontation with reality, and, and that can be an occasion for their conversion, or at least for their moral culpability to take hold. Now, what we can't do, I think, personally, is judge the state of that person's soul. So we, we're rarely in a position to say, well, you know, I know that reality has shown you otherwise. You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I don't yeah. know. For me, this was a process over many, many years mm-hmm. of, of coming to see how wrong-headed my thinking had been. And, uh, you know, if I hadn't gone to graduate school, if I hadn't gotten married, if I hadn't had the experiences that I'd had, maybe I would still be in that fundamentalist group. You know, maybe I still wouldn't have had my eyes opened about the, mm. the wrong I was doing. And, uh, and so I, when I deal with other people, I want to be quite generous in, in assigning them to outer darkness or, you know, deciding that they're in mortal sin. What I can say is, hey, do you recognize that your actions are gravely harmful and they're hurting people in these very concrete and specific ways? And if the person comes back and says, well, what you call evil, I call good, you know, well, there's not, there's not much I can do at that point, yeah. except to try to take them back to first principles. Um, and so I'll leave the question of the judgment of souls up to God. But, I, but I, I know that we're all human beings made with the same rational nature. We all have to deal with the same reality of our bodies and our world and our planet. And so we're all confronted with the same existential dilemma. And, uh, and I do think that when, when one religious tradition tends to run contrary to that, uh, it's going to cause uh, discord in their lives and others that is objectively noticeable and could be an occasion for conversion. Yeah. Hey, Joe, thank you so much for your call today from Cleveland. It is called a communion here on EWTN. Let's go to Nick now. He is in Illinois listening on the great WSFI. Hey there, Nick, what's on your mind today, sir? Hello, gentlemen, and thanks for taking my call. Uh, So, Dr. Anders, I was wondering if you could uh, sort of refute the philosophical position of determinism. I've been listening to some, you know, uh, talks from atheists like Dawkins and Sam Harris and was just curious on how you would go about debating, you know, um, their position. Sure. Appreciate the question. So Sam Harris's position is that free will does not exist 
because my free human choices are conditioned by my attitudes, my prejudices, my ideas, uh, my biology, uh, by things that are all antecedent to the act of choice. And since, you know, I, like I, I, you know, I, some people are biologically incapable. They're genetically incapable of liking cilantro. <laughs> like there's actually a genetic marker for liking cilantro or just some half the population thinks it tastes like soap. The other half thinks it's like the ambrosia of the gods. I'm, mm. I happen to be in the second category. Like I can't not like cilantro. Yeah, me too. Right. Love I mean, it. I just, I love, so I'm one of the cilantro lovers, you know, <laughs> and, and there's things like that about my personality that absolutely I can't control. They're not within my free choice. Okay. And you can multiply those things until there's quite a lot of them, right? I have absolutely no control over the place of my birth, the timing of my birth, who my parents were, what my genetics were, the educational choices they made for me, the company that I kept. All these things were things that were givens uh, over which I had no free control. And, of course, that's going to have a, a maybe even a determining effect on the way I live my life, the kind of choices that I make. And, I mean, uh, you know, demographers make really powerful predictions about the way racial and demographic groups are going to vote, right? I mean, birds of a feather. I mean, yeah. that, they, they, so there's, there, is a, there, there is a lot of truth in that position, a lot of truth in that position. From my point of view, where, where Harris and the like go wrong is, is not everything they've pointed out about the conditioning of human decision-making. I think that they're correct. I, I don't actually have any issue with that. It's the definition of free will that I think is at issue. Mm. And so for Harris, he says, well, you know, because we don't have what philosophers would call, you know, perfect libertarian free will, which is, uh, you know, my, my will is like this free floating needle, you know, that's bouncing around in a vacuum with absolutely no influences on it that can just spontaneously point itself in any given direction. Because I don't have that kind of freedom. Well, then I don't have freedom. And my answer is, well, how do you know that's what freedom is? And Harris's response is, well, that's just what the word means. And I said, no. You're just stipulating that that's what the word means. Yeah. I don't think that's what the word means, right? I think the word means that that I subjectively have the power to rationally deliberate between goods. And and you must admit into your canon of evidence subjective experience, right? I, I, I am introspectively aware of my act of moral choice. I understand that my moral choices are conditioned but they're still moral choices. Sure, sure. Right? Now, from the Catholic point of view, they actually are conditioned by God's predetermination. So Catholics are determinists of a sort in that we think that free human action is determined by God. Free human action is determined by God. God knows what every human being is going to choose, and he has orchestrated human history to a determinate end. All right. So there's a type of determinism involved in in Catholic theology, but it's one that makes use of human freedom rather than one that denies it. But St. Thomas, who's who's one Catholic voice among many, and you don't have to hold Thomas's view of freedom. There are different accounts of human freedom within the Catholic theological tradition. Duns Scotus, for example, mm -hmm. takes a completely different account of freedom from Thomas. Thomas's understanding of freedom is that freedom just is the ability to rationally deliberate between chosen goods. Right. Um, and which I think is just introspectively obvious. It's like it's like um, trying to deny that we have intentions. Now, there are some radical determinists and materialists, I think Alex Rosenberg takes this position, who claims that humans don't actually have intentions. And, and, and you know, that, that, is the, that is the directedness of human thought, the fact that I can think about Tom Price or about my teacup Right. That's that's what we mean by intentionality. OK. And uh, it, it's a sort of core idea in phenomenology, like that the awareness that human life and consciousness is characterized by this this directionality that we call intention. Like all you have to do is just introspect and you know that you think about things. Sure. But believe it or not, it's actually very hard to account for that philosophically. Philosophers of mind have a difficult time accounting for where does intentionality come from? within a purely materialistic scheme of consciousness, right? It's very hard to account for. Doesn't mean we don't know we have it. Just because you can't give an account of it philosophically or explain its origins doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It exists because here I am thinking about it, you see? So yeah. that, that's, that's personally how I deal with the issue of determinism. I don't have a problem with Harris's argument. I actually agree with most of it. 
I disagree with his definition, not of determinism, but of freedom. Okay. Hey, Nick, thanks so much for your call today. It's called a communion here on EWTN. We invite you to discover the beauty and truth and goodness of the Catholic Church with the EWTN online learning series. You can delve into the riches of the faith and grow closer to our Lord with free videos and study guides. EWTN invites you to be still and sit with the Lord through a wonderful program, In His Sandals. It's our online video reflections with EWTN's chaplain, Father Joseph Mary Wolf. Enroll in our courses today at EWTN.com. Here's, here's the address, learningseries.EWTN.com. I'll give you that again, learningseries.EWTN.com. It's called the Communion here on EWTN. Let's go to a Maria, a first-time caller in Fargo, listening on the great Real Presence Radio. Hey there, Maria, what's on your mind today? Thank you so much for taking my call, gentlemen. Sure. My question is, I had a run-in with a Seventh-day Adventist the other day, totally randomly, and we just kind of struck up conversation. And he was talking about kind of where they got their name and how they keep the Sabbath on basically the seventh day and how the Sabbath is for all men and not just um, a Jewish thing, not just a Christian thing, but for all people. I agree with that, or like Sabbath should be for all people. What I'm wondering, however, is he made it sound like the reason that most people in the world celebrate the Sabbath on Sunday is because of a decision that uh, Pope made. I can't remember which one, forgive me. Um, But a decision that the Pope made many, many years ago in conjunction with the, he said, pagan emperor Constantine, and the Pope changed the commandments to allow for the Sabbath to be celebrated uh, on Sunday, because in the Roman Empire, the day of worship, you know, that was given to the gods was on the Sunday. So it was kind of an effort to uh, bring a true worship back to, to yep. God. But the issue, of course, is like the Pope can't change the commandments. I know that for a fact. Um but I don't know my history well enough to be able to refute that argument at that point, and I've never heard it before. So okay. I'm yep. wondering what you have to say. Yep, I, I understand. Uh, the argument is completely complete and utter hogwash, poppycock, hooey, right? <laughs> and, and radically misunderstands New Testament doctrine and the Catholic position in this question. So first of all, it is entirely false to assert that Christians moved the date of the Sabbath. That is just false. We did not. The Sabbath is still on Saturday. And Jews everywhere throughout the world stop working on Saturday. Now, go back and read the Sabbath commandment. Go read it in Exodus chapter 20. Says nothing about worship. Does not say, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God on the Sabbath. Doesn't say that. It says, you shall do no work on the Sabbath. Doesn't say anything about worship. Not one word. Hebrews worshiped God seven days a week. They offered sacrifice in the temple seven days a week. Sunday, the Christian feast of Sunday, is not primarily a day of resting from work. That's not its primary function. The Christian feast of Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of the Lord, which took place unambiguously, and this is an every one of the four Gospels, on the first day of the week. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on the first day of the week, because he rose on the first day of the week, namely Sunday. Furthermore, it was not Constantine that began the celebration of the uh, the Lord's resurrection on Sunday. It was the apostles. It says so in sacred scripture. Acts chapter 20. Verse 18, um, excuse me, verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we gather together to break bread, and breaking bread, of course, is a, is a, a metonymy here for the Eucharist, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, it, is a, it is an apostolic practice. When you read the fathers of the second century, when you read the fathers of the third century, when you read the fathers of the fourth century, all before Constantine, none of them have any knowledge 
of a Eucharist being celebrated any day other than Sunday. Now, unfortunately, and it is unfortunate, uh, many of the church fathers had a distinctly sort of anti-Judaistic bias. Um, it would be, it'd be anachronistic to call them anti-Semites because they didn't have a racial uh, category for Jewish people, but they did, they, they did say some unkind things about the rabbis and, and Jewish practice. It became a point of pride to some of the early church fathers of the second, third, and fourth century before Constantine that they didn't celebrate the Jewish Sabbath, but rather worshiped the Lord and celebrated his resurrection on the first day. So it's, it's historically false, the claim that your friend is making. It is biblically false. It's theologically false. Um, for, finally, uh, is the command to cease from work on the seventh day obligatory for all people in all times? Well, not according to sacred scripture. And in Colossians chapter 2, St. Paul says that you should not let anyone judge you with respect to what you eat or drink, with regard to any religious festival, that's the religious calendar, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. The entire book of Hebrews uh, is about the argument that Christ is greater than Moses, the new covenant supersedes the old, and that in Jesus we have a new Sabbath rest that we look forward to in heaven. And and so uh, one of the reasons, one of the symbolic reasons for celebrating the resurrection on the first day of the week is that the church has always regarded this as the beginning of the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. The Sabbath rest of the seventh day instituted by God in the book of Exodus was a celebration, a remembrance, a recollection of God's work of creation when he made the world and the heavens and the earth and Adam and Eve. But the resurrection is a celebration of the recreation of the entire universe in Jesus. All right. And we thank you so much for your call, Maria. Very good question. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Eric is calling in from Kansas, watching us on YouTube today. Hello, Eric. What's on your mind today, sir? Yeah. Hi, guys. I just have a couple of questions quickly. Uh, Dr. David Anders, I believe it was yesterday's show that you were talking about the Council of Trent and the canons and the anathema and how they were intended for Catholics, which I agree with. However, and Please forgive me if I misrepresent what you said yesterday. You said the anathemas do not apply today. Now, my question is, um, if a bishop or any Catholic, for that matter, were to publicly teach the doctrine of faith alone as, like, Luther taught it and not recant, would he not be uh, ecclesiastically excommunicated? Oh, yeah, he, and would, my- he, would, he would be. He would be, or at least he potentially would be. He would, if a... If a if a Catholic bishop formally denied the dogma of the Council of Trent, then he would be a formal heretic okay. and would be subject to the penalty of excommunication. However, the specific penalty of anathema, which is a species of excommunication, is no longer administered in the Catholic Church. So okay. we, we, if you read the Code of Canon Law, you're not going to find a section on anathemas. Mm-hmm. You will find a discussion of excommunication. And, uh, and, a, and a bishop most certainly could be excommunicated if he formally denied a dogma of the faith, and the dogma on justification is a dogma of the faith. Okay. Did that answer your question, Eric? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. And I just, uh, I had a quick second question. Um, Tom, what did you have for lunch? It's usually always about Dr. David. We are, are, what a nice man. What a nice man. He asked about my lunch. I had a very delicious sandwich prepared by my sweetheart. Lovely. Yeah, it was fantastic. Eric, I had chickpeas and shiitake mushrooms. I had Look to throw that you. out there. Yeah. Wow. Very impressive. Eric, thanks so much for your call. Here is Linnell now in Cincinnati, listening on the great Sacred Heart Radio. Linnell, what's on your mind today? Thank you very much. I wanted to say that um, I enjoy you every day listening to both of you. And I wanted to say that yesterday I spoke to a friend who was a uh, former... Catholic. He's now Lutheran. And his problem, one of the problems with the Catholic Church is when they are in the presence of the Pope, they uh, will bow and kiss his ring. And I, he said, he quoted Revelation chapter 22, somewhere in there about how an angel told a man, you cannot bow to me, but only to God. Um, the thing about kissing the ring that only Catholics can kiss the Pope's ring if they're in his presence, he was just totally appalled 
with that. And I really had no history uh, understanding why we kiss the Pope's ring or even a bishop's ring. Uh, can you explain? Yeah, thanks very much, Linnell. I appreciate that. So, you know, a um, year or so ago, I was in Ohio, and uh, you know, I'm not much of a football fan, so I don't always, I'm, I'm kind of slow on the uptake here, okay? <laughs> but, um, but I was giving a talk, and the, the folks I was speaking to said, hey, Dr. Ash, could you hold your arms in this particular shape, uh... you know? And I'm like, I don't know where this is going, and I do, and of course, they all snap a picture, and then I come to find out that this is like, you know, the Buckeye thing, you know? O-H-I-O. Oh, right, exactly. We, we get it. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and my point is that there, there are traditional forms of reverence that are shown to say sports teams, right? It was unintelligible to me, not not being from Ohio sure. and not you know not watching a lot of football, and uh, but if you went to you know a, a Crimson Tide game or a you know a Auburn game here sure. in Alabama, you know you you you'd hear the various chants and mm-hmm. and um, and shibboleths that we that we shout out at one another to identify our loyalty. And if you don't think there's honor and reverence being shown to sports teams, I don't know what planet you live on, right? <laughs> and uh, and you know, when I have been in court, which has fortunately not been that often, um, when the judge walks in, what does the bailiff say? All rise. All rise. Yeah. And if, if you want to get a good judgment out of the judge, you, you better rise. Better get you, up. Know, you better rise. And so uh, in different venues, uh, every culture, Catholic, non-Catholic, whatever, has, uh, has recognized forms of reverence that are expressed. You know, um, when I was growing up in the Presbyterian Church, um, if uh, if my pastor had come by and said hello, at the very least, my parents would have expected me to look him in the eye and say, you know, yes, sir, please, and thank you. I mean, mm. I, there are gestures that would be understood to be reverential and respectful according to uh, the dignity of the person in office. Mm-hmm. And that that disposition is, in fact, just and biblical. So St. Paul says in Romans chapter t- uh, 12 that we are to show, to give to everyone what is his due— Honor to whom honor, and custom to whom custom. Okay. Now, in uh, in the Catholic Church is a very old society. It is a very old society. The, the papacy is the longest running, oldest institution in Western culture, and so many of the signs of reverence are a lot older even than the Ohio Buckeyes. Wow! Right? They go back. They go back to imperial times. Sure. And and while they are, they might strike. A modern person is somewhat anachronistic in that, you know, we don't use those same form of forms of reverence today. The showing of reverence as such is not an ancient practice. It's a modern one as well. Mm-hmm. But the particular forms of reverence would have been appropriate, would have been understood to be appropriate in, in an ancient context and would have been shown not only to popes, but to kings and emperors and dukes and lords and in and, and all kinds of social roles, mm-hmm. right? And that's the way I think it should best be understood, that that the Pope is, uh, he's a very important person. He is an authoritative person within the church. And St. Paul says we should show uh, the proper forms of reverence, honor, and custom to those to whom is it is uh, due. And this is not an act of worship. It is just the same kind of appropriate form of reference for that venue, for that context, that you would find, say, in a courtroom or in, you know, the houses of Congress or in the presence of the president or even, believe it or not, in the presence of the Ohio Buckeyes. Oh, wow. There you go. Uh, Linnell, thanks so much for your call. Here is Molly now in Peoria listening on the EWTN app, a free download. Hey there, Molly. What's on your mind today? Hi. I know you don't have a lot of time, um, so I'll try to make this quick. It it bothers me. Um, I'm ashamed to admit this, but it bothers me as a Catholic that I feel like I'm held before God to a different standard, um, you know, than an atheist uh, when I'm going to be judged. Um, And I, I, by the good friends that I have who are atheists, it's not that they are bad people necessarily, but I just feel like um, they have made a a intentional decision to remain atheist because they— you know, avoid accountability. I, I don't know. Um, okay, we just have about I, yeah. 30 seconds left okay. here. So if the decision is to take a religious point of view as a way of dodging moral responsibility, well, that decision would be imputable. That would be that would be morally blameworthy. That's true for religious people as well. So, I mean, I know religious people who take the religious option 
as a way of justifying bad behaviors, right? Mm. So it's, it does, it's not just automatically true that religious people always take the moral high ground. They don't, right? And there are atheists that will take morally superior positions to say like a fanatical religious extremist, right? Mm-hmm. What, what, what makes us morally culpable is whether or not we follow the rule of right reason, that is the standard of moral acts, whether you're an atheist or a believer, And that is accessible to us all because of our common human nature, which is made in the likeness and image of God. Glad we could get that question in for you, Molly. Thanks so much for your call today. Dr. David Anders, thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. We do this program Monday through Friday on EWTN Radio at 2 p.m. Eastern. Check out the podcast anytime by going to EWTN.com slash radio and look for the words Podcast Central. On behalf of our fantastic team here, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Hey, thanks for joining us. See you next time on the next edition of Call to Communion here on EWTN. God bless.